Good morning, everyone. My name is Kei Ichimatsudawa from Hitachi. Uh, I will introduce our current study about an application local library file system for persistent memory. Uh, several file systems optimized for persistent memory are already proposed. We are investigating another file system leveraging its performance of PM uh, that is fully implemented as a library in user space and those files are shared between specific processes and that is COMPOSIX compliant for backward compatibility. So why a new file system is required? Uh, typically, the file system manages its state consistently across the system. We focus that many modern applications such as database systems and software build use their own dedicated directory. Oh, these two figures show uh, examples of such applications. Left figure shows the data, data files of MongoDB. All files in this directory are owned by MongoDB users. So only MongoDB user can access these files. Right side shows the contents of the build directory of GRUBC package of Ubuntu Linux. The build step creates numerous intermediate files in this directory but only the final artifacts are used as a package. In these examples, these files are not shared with other applications or system. Furthermore, these applications issue huge number of metadata operations and small IOs, so handling these kinds of operations efficiently is needed for faster application performance. So we propose an application local file system leveraging PM for these modern applications. Its state, such as namespace and inode management, is closed for the specific application. So it can simplify the state management and omit some security features, such as access controls, for pasta operations. We build an application local file system as user space library. The processes that make up an application share PM, and each process access contents on PM directly without any task switching. The library runs under GRUBC and provides POSIX compliant interfaces, so no modification or rebuild of the application is needed. Currently, single process multi version is working and it performs better than kernel-based file systems in micro-benchmarks for small files. Multiprocess support is ongoing, and we are designing data structure and log strategy. We expect our file system provides faster access, especially for metadata operations and small IOs. That's all over my talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Azat Nurgaliev and I'm a PhD student in data management group at the German Aerospace Center. Today, I will report on our work in progress research entitled Automated IO Parameter Tuning of Scientific Application with Parameterizable Workload Replace. In our work, we are considering scientific applications from data intensive domains such as profit observation and radio astronomy. Due to the sheer size of the processed data, we typically don't entirely fit into the main memory, which can cause several IO performance problems. To solve IO issues, usually data is moved to the fast flash-based storage such as NVMe SSDs. But simply storing data on SSDs alone usually does not result in a better IO performance. But it also requires changes to the way how the application issues IO requests important application parameters which directly influence the overall performance as a number of parallel layer requests and the size of the individual layer requests. Moreover, every storage device has its own very distinctive performance characteristics, which can be derived from the internal architecture of the SSD, such as already reported performance difference between non-based SSDs and 3D cross-point based SSDs. In this work, we are focused on two fundamental layer parameters, the level of polarization and the size of IO request size. They have a direct relation to each other. A bigger IO request size means that a lower degree of polarization could be used and vice versa. In the plot, we are depict the execution type of a presentative scientific application for various degrees of polarization and IO request sizes. 
The application is the form aware of observation domain and reads around 30 gigabytes of high-resolution images in GOT file format and uses the GDAL Geospatial Library. As you could see, increasing the parallelization level leads to significant in orders of magnitude performance improvements. The goal of this work is to automatically derive application parameters for optimal IO configuration of data-intensive scientific applications. In order to do a fine-grained I.O. analysis and tuning, we need tools which can precisely capture an application I.O. workload and replace the workload with modified I.O. parameters. On this slide, we review and compare existing tools for I.O. analysis and tracing. Every tool has its own advantages and disadvantages, but none fully satisfies our needs. In order to tackle this challenge, we propose the following approach. We treat the application as a black box and collect all IO logs from the application run using the BLK trace tools. Next, we convert the application IO log into jobs for the few two, which can mimic various application IO patterns while also considering computational delays. We replace these few jobs with various IO parameter configurations until the optimal set of parameters on a given storage device is identified. To summarize our approach, I am to improving the overall execution performance of scientific applications by tailoring important IO parameters to the specifics of the underlying storage device. However, there is a number of open questions for which we would like to get feedback and engage in discussion. The first question is how should the application run be organized? Which approach to use, sampling or complete run? How big should a data set be in order to sufficiently represent the dominating application are your pattern? The second question is how to improve the accuracy of replaying workloads with complex computations. With that, I would like to finish my presentation. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Hi everyone, my name is Lolita and our paper is called Mitigating Write-Ahead Log Contention on Shared Storage Devices. We focus on the performance of write-ahead logs. Write-ahead logs, while for short, are the key in databases to providing durability guarantees while also achieving low latency. Any changes to the system are first written to the wall. Once changes to the wall are synced to storage and made durable, changes to the needed data structure stored elsewhere can be done in the background. Most systems that use walls recommend that they are stored on a dedicated storage device, but often when people buy machines, it is on a shared storage device. If both the wall and application data is stored on the same device, the background writes and the wall writes will contend with each other. This contention will increase the latency and decrease throughput of wall writes, thus affecting system performance. This motivated us to look at application level solutions for consistent wall performance on shared storage devices. Our plan was to use priorities to give preference to wall writes. Priorities allow us to get our important requests in the front so they don't get delayed. We will be using Flash. A Flash device has a notion of multiple queues. When those queues are full, in the end it looks like one queue because all queues in Flash are backed up and you have a block scheduler process. In theory, if wall writes always have highest priority, they should get close to the latency that they would receive on a dedicated device. This is challenging because wall writes often come from the same application that is generating the bulk background writes. So it was not as simple as running an application with a system call named IOnice, which sets priority by application. So instead, we will be using IOPrioSet, a system call which sets priority by thread, threads or processes. We started off by creating experiments to model wall writes as small 4 kilobyte synchronous writes and background writes as large 536 megabyte writes in C. The experiment continually writes small and large background writes in separate processes with small writes set as high priority. This is the graph with small writes running on their own for 60 seconds. Notice that the y-axis goes from 0.05 milliseconds to 0.4 milliseconds. The orange line is the rolling mean. On their own, small writes achieve very low latency. This is our graph with small writes in the presence of large background writes using threads. We tried high priority on threads, but it didn't work. This led to the discovery that although set has a thread parameter, the call only works here when we fork. Also, we needed to use a block scheduler that supports priorities so either BFQ or CFQ. Third, we needed to use direct I.O. to make sure the writes were done with the correct priority. This also meant that we needed to use aligned memory. We can see the contention problem clearly in our graph. Notice that the y-axis goes from 0 milliseconds to 140 milliseconds. The orange line is the rolling mean. 
we see that small rights run very quickly until 10 seconds, which is when our large background rights come in, causing the small right latency to increase. The large rights end 10 seconds early and we achieve low latency with our small rights again. This is a graph with high priority small rights in the presence of large background rights. Notice that the y-axis goes from 0 milliseconds to 0.8 milliseconds. The orange line represents the rolling mean. We can see that high priority small rights achieve low latency, similar to small rights running on their own. These are all three graphs together. Notice that the y-axis goes from 0 milliseconds to 140 milliseconds. The blue line is the latencies of small rights mixed with background large rights. The red line is a rolling mean of those latencies. Along the bottom, you can see the small rights by themselves, along with the high priority mixed rights. The two lines with their averages are there, but we got them so close together, the performance difference can't be seen here. We are now working on Java and C libraries for integrating applications that use walls, starting with Apache Zookeeper. Instead of having two separate devices for snapshots and wall, we will have snapshots and wall rights in two separate processes, sending wall rights as high priority through a pipe. So, with the proper block scheduler and dedicated high priority wall processes, we can achieve consistent wall performance on a shared device. Thank you to the collaborators Kayla Walton and Ben Reed, as well as the audience. Feel free to contact me if you have any follow-up questions. Hello everyone. Thanks for attending my presentation. My name is Hojin Nam from Kite. Today, I'm going to talk about semantics aware shadow paging, handling transaction conflict in EFT4 journaling. I will give you today's talk contents. First, let me introduce our motivation. EFT4 adopts journaling to maintain its consistency. Fire operations in the EFT4 insert the modified log blocks to the running transaction. The log blocks in the running transaction are written in the general area of the disk in atomic and durable manner by the JVD thread. An application may try to modify the pages which are being committed to the storage by the JVD thread. We call this phenomenon as a transaction conflict. If transaction conflict occurs, the application thread must wait for the completion of the commit. Yet for resolve the, the transition conflict using shadow paging. When the conflict occurs, the application thread causing conflict creates the shadow page of the conflict page. JVD thread uses the shadow page for the commit and the file operation modifies the original page. But the shadow page can be allocated only when the page is not being transferred to the storage. It is because the page that has been already transferred cannot be replaced with another page. In this case, the application thread waits for the completion of the transferring the conflict page, degrading the application performance substantially. To resolve this problem, we suggest semantics aware shadowing page. Now, let me introduce our design. Firstly, SSP identities the pages causing conflict frequently using the LRU list. Based on the classified results, modified ES4 with SSP allocates the shadow pages for the page, pages causing conflict frequently in advance. Therefore, SSP can eliminate the delay due to transaction conflict with minimal memory copy overhead for create, creating shadow pages. We physically measure the frequency of the conflicts for each block type to distinguish which block should be shadowed. Based upon the frequency of conflicts, we establish two groups for five system blocks, the warm group and the hot group. In the hot group, there are five system wide metadata such as superblock, group descriptor table, inode bitmap, and data bitmap. For the pages in the hot group, JVD thread always creates the shadow page when the transaction commit starts. In the warm group, there are per file metadata such as inode table and directory entry. For the pages in the warm group, 
it allocates the shadow pages when they are in the LRU list. The LRU list is updated in every completion of the commit. The size of the LRU window is determined based upon miss ratio curve. Finally, I will show you the performance of ext 4 with SSP. We examine the performance benefit of SSP using VAMEL workload. The VAMEL benchmark simulates the behavior of a mail server. We use the 40-core server and as a storage, the Intel obtained 900p. This graph shows the throughput of the original EST4 and the EST4 with SSP. We evaluated the throughput varying the number of threads from 1 to 40. When the number of threads is 40, SSP improved the throughput of the EST4 by 52%. In the original EST4, the throughput does not scale when the number of threads becomes 10 or more. Semantics Aware Shadow Paging improves both throughput and scalability of the EST4 journaling successfully. Thank you for my listening for my presentation. Hello everyone. I'm Chi Liang Li from University of Science and Technology of China. In this work, we propose a fast approach to failure reconstruction for large disk inclusions based on RAID 2.0. RAID 2.0 is widely used in large disk pools. It divides each disk into chunks and constructs RAID groups by randomly selected chunks. Here is an example of constructing a 2-1 RAID 5 group. A1, A2, AP, B1, B2, BP, etc. RAID 2.0 meets enterprise's needs for flexible resource scheduling and faster reconstruction. Its reconstruction is usually performed in batches due to restrictions on rebuild rate and the intensity of foreground application IOs, and reconstruct a certain number of chunks in each batch. As a result, Random data layout suffers high skewness within a batch. To evaluate local load imbalance in a batch, we define lambda read and write, which is the ratio of the maximum number of read or write to average. Here is an example of the cumulative distribution function of 100 batches. We can observe that with random data layout, maximum read load is 1.5 times to 2.7 times the average and the maximum write load is three times to six times the average. Designing a dedicated data layout is a popular way to uniformly distribute the data across all disks and spread reconstruction workloads in a balanced manner. However, it faces some problems. Firstly, the cost of relocating data from a long-used status to a well-designed data layout and the interim status to normal is extremely heavy. Secondly, batch size to reach reconstruction load balance for the dedicated data layout depends on the dynamical properties. It cannot take the real-time workloads in storage systems into consideration. So we propose RAID 2.0++, an efficient reconstruction mechanism that balances local reconstruction workloads with a flexible batch size and without relocating data. When it comes to a single disk failure, RAID 2.0++ consists of the following steps. First, we build a model to determine the batch size according to restrictions on rebuild rate and the intensity of foreground application IOs, and initialize a batch of tasks. Then we obtain the read load of each survived disk induced by reconstructing the batch of tasks. To avoid some heavy loaded disks being bottlenecks, we choose tasks reading source data from light loaded disks in the pending reconstruction tasks queen to replace the improper tasks one by one. Finally, reconstruct the lost chunks in memory and distribute the chunks to survive disks based on matching theory. We process all re reconstruction tasks in batches. We implement a prototype of RAID 2.0++ and conduct our evaluation. 
the figure shows the cumulative distribution function of 100 batches. Compared with random data layout for read, our approach averagely improves the lambda read by 41% and averagely improves the lambda write by 74%. From the results, our approach can efficiently eliminate local load imbalance in reconstruction. In the following work, we're trying to build a model to determine the batch size while considering the dynamic workloads. Meanwhile, we plan to implement our algorithm with isomorphic and heterogeneous disks and run different workloads with different features to make evaluations. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Wei Wan from University of Science and Technology of China. In this work, we study transformation from replication to usual code and propose updated from the encoding to reduce the update cost of your coded files and the cost run traffic during encoding. Clustered file systems first store data with replication to ensure high performance. When data become called, transforming files from replication to your code for no story overhand. When updating a your coded file, we need to generate parity blocks. Different encoding induces different update costs and existing encoding induces high update costs. We use encoding from C replication to three to URL code as an example to explain the update cost of files. Assuming that file A is divided into three blocks and each block holds three replicas. File P is divided into two blocks and each block holds three replicas and so on. Existing master randomly snags three blocks a1, B1, C1 to construct a stripe and generate two parity blocks and constructs other three stripes in the same way. If file A is updated, A1 is updated to A1 upon strafe, and so on. To preserve reliability, we need to update the parity blocks for three stripes. To generate the six parity blocks, the disk IOs are 15 blocks and it, it needs to transform 12 blocks. So randomly selecting blocks for Stripe will cause high update cost. In addition, encoding will induce cost run traffic. For example, there are five ranks and each rank consists of six nodes. We encode A1, B1, C1 from three replication to three to your code. In step one, select a rank to perform encoding, C rank three. In step two, Rank 3 reads C1 across ranks. And then Rank 3 performs the encoding and generates the parity box P1, P2, and writes P2 to Rank 4. Finally, preserve one replica for each block, remove other replicas, and relocate A1 from Rank 3 to Rank 5 for tolerating rank level failures. Thus, the encoding will induce cost rank traffic. To solve the above problems, we propose updated file encoding, which significantly reduces the updated cost of your coded files, and at the meantime, reduce the cost run traffic during encoding. The main idea is selecting data blocks of a stripe from as few files as possible according to the metadata. We store blocks of the same files in the same stripe. For example, data blocks of file A from the first stripe and data blocks of file B and file E from the second stripe, and so on. In this way, if updating file A into a, a upon surface to regenerate the two parity blocks, the TC IOs are five blocks, and it needs to transform four blocks. To minimize the cost of traffic, the main idea is selecting the rank holding the most blocks of a stripe as an encoding rank, that is rank two. This minimizes the cost rank read. Rank 2 generates and stores parity blocks P1 and P2. We smartly select ranks to store each block, and each rank stores no more than n blocks of a stripe to tolerate the single rank failures. So we store A1 and A2 in rank 1, A3 in rank 3. Finally, remove other replicas. We conduct experiments and find that UFV reduces the deletion cost by 17.7% and the cost run traffic by 76%, comparing with the default encoding of HDFS. 
In the following work, we try to deploy UFE in real cluster device systems, solve the problem of metadata management, and conduct experiments. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Jolt, and in the next few minutes, I will give you a quick overview of some of our ongoing work. Most of the big data computation in the cloud happens in a multi-layered setup. And even though this has many benefits, it also introduces data movement bottlenecks. We have known for a long while that pushing down computation to the storage nodes can actually alleviate these bottlenecks. And today we live in an exciting time where solutions uh, built around this idea are appearing in practice. In the cloud, such as the Amazon Aqua solution, um, in, in commodity hardware, such as the Samsung Smart SSDs, and um, appliances such as the PlyOps computational storage. Most of the systems that I mentioned came to be as a result of decades worth of research on how to make processing inside the storage happen with high performance and high efficiency. Moving forward, however, I think um, there is an imperative to look at other types of challenges such as privacy. And indeed, what we're doing in our ongoing work is looking into ways in which we can offer system support for enforcing privacy rules inside the distributed storage layer. More specifically, we're looking at ways of monitoring and transforming data. And in order to achieve this goal without actually slowing down the application running on top, we're exploring the use of specialized hardware-based smart storage nodes using FPGAs to offer low latency and high predictability privacy-related computation. In the following, I will look at two directions that we are currently exploring in my group. One direction of our work is in collaboration with Sujanya and Vijay from the University of Texas at Austin, and it looks into how we can use smart storage nodes to enforce data protection regulations uh, with minimal overhead. And as you might be all aware, uh, GDPR and similar frameworks uh, incur uh, significant overhead if we cannot actually offload some of these operations to the storage. What we propose is to take a software-defined approach and um, look at the storage as uh, basically an enforcement layer that doesn't take decisions and to dedicate um, the decision-making to a software controller. In some sense, this is similar to software-defined stor storage, but we look at um, access and protection instead of performance-related issues. As a result, we can simplify the requirements, the processing requirements inside the nodes, and we can almost achieve today uh, this goal by repurposing existing building blocks in the field. Now I say almost because we are still missing two important puzzle pieces. One is offering trusted execution environments inside the storage node. And if you're interested in why this is actually necessary, please go and read our paper. And the other puzzle pieces, uh, how do, can we efficiently map high level uh, data regulation to uh, low level uh, software defined data protection rules? To tee up the second direction of our ongoing work, let's take a look at the simplified view of a data processing pipeline. As you can see, the first step is data retrieval, which of course maps to the storage node. And then the second step is the actual query computation. And this can either map to the compute nodes or in the case of a smart storage solution can be partially or entirely offloaded to the smart storage node. In contrast, if we look at the data processing pipeline where we have to carry out privacy preserving operations or you know, perturbations to be more specific um, between data retrieval and query processing or after the query processing, what happens is that since these perturbations can typically only be executed inside the compute nodes, um, the smart storage might become unfeasible for query offload. So what we're advocating for in our ongoing work is to explore ways in which we can actually offload perturbations to the smart storage and through this, keep it relevant for future workloads. With colleagues from the Technical University of Cluj-Napoca, we have implemented two of the shelf algorithms inside Smart Storage Node to understand the trade-offs and future challenges of providing privacy-preserving perturbations. And one algorithm is um, performing randomized 3D rotations on the data um, that hides personal information, but still allows uh, one to train uh, some types of classifiers on the data and this way retains some utility. The other algorithm is uh, differential privacy that uh, we apply inside the storage on top of histograms and group by aggregates computed also inside the storage node. 
What is interesting is that in the first type of algorithm, uh, which happens uh, right after retrieving the data from um, persistent storage, the main challenges are related to implementing these operations in a way that guarantees line rate. Whereas for the second type of algorithm, because the data set that it works on is smaller uh, than the data is being that the data that is being retrieved from the storage, um, its challenges are not so much on the high performance implementation, but more on finding ways of integrating this with the higher level control frameworks available in software. So that was our ongoing work in a nutshell. If you want to discuss further, please feel free to reach out and thanks for your attention.